So um, Marsh is now representing his own sociotechnical.org. Uh, but um, we know you at Pranovix, we know you from Apigee as well, where you have spent more than a decade um, laying out the groundworks and then more. Um, and you write about a lot of things at sociotechnical.org. And you're also going to talk about what happens when people and machines and their practices meet, right? Yes. Thanks. Uh, glad to be here. Um, you can hear me okay and everything sounds good? Yes. Awesome. Thanks. Cool. All right. Uh, welcome. This is what changes when everyone can code uh, and rethinking API product journeys in an LLM world. Uh, I'm Marsh Gardner. I spent a number of years at Apogee and Google as a product manager. Um, I really, I've been in product roles since I left university. And this photo of me was taken when the iPhone was still new. Not long after that is when I started in 2009 as Apache's product manager, when it was just a small science experiment in a mostly failing startup. Um, I continued through an IPO becoming part of Google and did that for another seven years there until I left last fall. Along the way, I've also been involved with Swagger before it was called Swagger and built what would become the first Swagger editor. Uh, later helped get the specification into the Open API initiative and have served as a governing board member and marketing chair and continue to serve as a technical steering committee member since that formed. I'm a, you probably guessed, big believer in open standards and open source, uh, also working with the CNC platform engineering working group. Um, there's a maturity model we published last fall uh, that if you're interested in platform engineering, you might take a look at. Um, and uh, as Laura said, since I left Google, I've also been writing at sociotechnical.org. That's a bit about me. Um, so I want to talk about uh, something I wrote about in January, um, which is what makes an API product? Because I think that's important to getting to the question of how do you handle adoption journeys? And so let me walk through a few things there. Um, first, every API has a technical contract. Um, an open API document is a way to describe much of the technical information that's necessary to use it. And basically it says that if you speak to me like this, you can expect an answer that looks like that. And, and I expect all, everyone on this call is somewhat familiar with this. So I'm not going to go deep into details on that. Um, but this is really necessary to address technical problems in distributed systems that have to talk to each other. Like if you have a mobile app and it needs to talk to a backend, you make an API to do that. So that's great until one day someone from outside your team asks if they can use it. And this is when you begin to enter into the social contract. Because look, it means that they're taking a dependency risk on you. And why are they doing that? They do that because they believe it will take less work to use your system for the foreseeable future than it would to build and run something similar themselves. So when you take that technical contract and you wrap it with this social contract, you get this new socio-technical object. And that for me is the great power of APIs. It's the ability to leverage the work of others. This is heading down the product path. So the moment you onboard a consumer user who's not also a producer, meaning they don't have responsibility or visibility into the service that implements the API, that's when you've crossed this threshold. And the social contract, it includes, but isn't limited to things like trust, stability, support, usage limits, et cetera. This is the uh, non-functional entitlements uh, in many ways that are around the technical object that is the API. So this is what I mean when I talk about as as products and there, there's sort of four uh, things you have to have here, four requirements. You have to have a producer, a consumer, a transaction, and repeatability. So let me explain what I mean. So the producer here, that's the, the person or group that produces uh, or possesses something of value, in this case, like a service that can solve the, a problem with code. Um, a consumer, therefore, is the another party that wants to trade something, right? You're not just giving your APIs away for free. There, there's a reason why you do that. Um, there's a trade-off here. And, and so what's happening is that there's a trade of something of value that's happening between the two. This doesn't mean you have to have a monetized API. This can happen with internal APIs. And so that's the exchange of value. That's the transaction. And then to the, the last piece is that you need repeatability. You have to be able to do this again and to scale it for it to be a product. So 
let's, let's play with this for a second. Um, maybe I'm a painter. It takes some amount of time for me to make a piece of art. And if I sell it to you, what happens? Well, I'm the producer, you're the consumer, and we've had an exchange of value. But what we don't have is repeatability. I can make another painting that's a lot like the original, but it's gonna be different. And if I do that too many times, I'm gonna get bored. So a way in which you can take that and turn it into a more of a product is to make prints and to sell those prints because then you get that repeatability that can scale. Okay, since this event is focused on AI, let's get into that. But since AI can mean many different things to different people, um, probably means different things to me, I, I wanted to explain the ways I like to think about a AI so that, especially LLMs, um, so that we're working from the same language base. So um, one of my early favorite metaphors is AI's infinite interns. You may have heard this, but. Uh, I, I like to I imagine this as, you know, like during the Renaissance and other art periods, there there were you know big successful painters and they often had workshops full of apprentices and junior painters. And those junior artists uh, could take on some of the grunt work that would have slowed down the master artists. And so the, what happens is, uh, you know, they, they the paint, junior painters and apprentices, they're taking on this more laborious or less skilled parts, like backgrounds and architectural elements or less focal figure, less focal figures. And this enables the the great masters to produce larger volumes of work than they could otherwise and to take undertake more significant commissions um, than they could have on their own. And and I think that's a great way to think about uh, AI as infinite interns. You can use AI to let you focus on what it is that you bring to differentiate the work product that you do. Um, so one way in which I use this, uh, this is an early AI success for me it's when I began to understand the power of this. I have this terrifically old website that I built in 2000 using you know, state-of-the-art front page technology uh, to document a trip that I took. And back then I didn't need HTTPS, but you do today. And so at some point I had migrated this mostly static site to Google, Google Cloud Storage, but to add a certificate to that, I was gonna have to add a load balancer. And that seemed like overkill for what was basically just a static HTML site. Um, and so on a whim, I thought, well, hey, do I wanna spend a number of hours under <laughs> relearning, cause I don't use Google Cloud Storage every day, relearning how Google Cloud Storage works, then learning how Firebase works, Firebase hosting, and then uh, you know, putting that into practice. I thought, you know what? I wonder if AI will help me here. And so, yes. And this is a great example of what large language models can do with documentation. It, I had a very specific use case. No one had written, I didn't find at least, uh, uh, a how-to for how I could go from a Google Cloud storage to uh, Firebase hosting. Uh, and I was shocked when I got uh, you know, about eight that process line by line to help me accomplish what would have taken me many hours otherwise. Um, a second metaphor I, I wanna bring and discuss is this idea, the AI is an idea dehydrator and rehydrator. So when you ask to AI to summarize a document, that's a good example of dehydration. And in the other direction, if you ask it to write about a topic, it'll take your instructions and rehydrate them. And this helps me think about how it does translation. So it uses math to distill some essence of the text, separating the ideas from the original language. Then it rehydrates those ideas into, the new, into a new language. And the image here actually comes from that technique. It's the same idea, just not in language. I, I, I wanted an illustration of the two sides of this process. So I gave it a brief description and it expanded it out into this image, hydrating it. Could it be better? Sure, but it's a decent starting point that's good enough. Um, one of my favorite GPTs is called Direct Answer. It really does one trick. It answers in one or two words and you can use this to, to resolve all kinds of arguments like who's the best uh, jazz musician, right? Um, in the last talk, Nilish, or not, no, the talk before last, Nilish mentioned embedding vectors. So embeddings, they convert documents uh, into vectors in this high dimensional space, such that similar documents end up having vectors that are closer to each other. 
And this makes it possible to identify things that have similar content or meaning. Um, and so the, I mean, there are a lot of recommendation systems also work this way. And Simon Willison had this fascinating post last fall based on a talk he'd given about embeddings. Um, and from that, you know, you can do things that are kind of weird and fun. So here's an example um, of taking that embeddings concept and using direct answer, which will give me, you know, strip out all of the extra stuff that ChatGPT likes to give in its flowery responses. Um, and you can do things like, I can say, what is Germany plus Paris minus France? And I get back Berlin. That's just kind of amazing to me that it it it's dehydrated the question that I've asked in order to understand that, you know, the equivalent uh, of Paris in France is Berlin. So um, I just think it's a neat example of, uh, of this idea uh, of how embedded vectors work and what it means to dehydrate and rehydrate. And the last analogy I'll bring is uh, one that I've come across. It's again, uh, brought to my attention by Simon Willison. Um, the LLMs are like a trained circus bear that can make you porridge in your kitchen. Uh, so look, it, 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 and this comes from uh, Alex Komorowski, um, who has a lot of fun, interesting thoughts about things. But look, it, it's a miracle that's able to do it at all. But watch out, because no matter how well they act like a human on some tasks, they're still a wild animal. They might ransack your kitchen. They could kill you accidentally or intentionally. Just because it can talk like a human doesn't mean it deserves the responsibility of a human. And then a warning not to give LLMs agency over you and to use them as a tool. So the example I gave before about migrating to Firebase hosting, there was actually one small mistake that I didn't find out until later. It had missed the flag to copy directories recursively. And so remember, you've got infinite circus bear interns that can do good work, but you have to stay a little paranoid. So from these metaphors and examples, you should have a little insight into how I've been using API and, and how I've been thinking about it. So to summarize, delegate the work to your infinite interns, apply its dehydration, rehydration powers for ideas, and don't forget that it's a circus bear in your kitchen that can make porridge or mess you up. Um, so with this in mind, let's now talk about how to put API into practice and then finish what it means to API journeys and documentation when you consider API products and the social contract. So. Um, first, uh, putting API into practice, uh, you know, rubber duck debugging. This is uh, when you know, a, a programmer can explain their code line by line to an inanimate object like a rubber duck. I have one here, actually. It's Winston Churchill just for this. Um, it's a way to find errors and solve problems by articulating your thought process, and you thereby gain these sort of new insights or spot mistakes. And if you've ever been struggling with a problem and tried to explain it to someone else, and in doing so found your answer, that's a really similar idea. When you explain it to others, it causes you to see it from a different perspective. Because these LLMs can feel human-like, just remember they're circus bears that can make porridge, they can act like a partner. And so in explaining what you want to it, you also are explaining it to yourself. Uh, you, it actually can be a great way to tease out requirements. What is it that you're really trying to accomplish if you have to explain it to someone else? It's a, and, and they're always available. Um, I actually made a custom GPT that I used to trick myself into writing. I instructed it to be an expert interviewer and to treat me as an expert on a topic and then ask probing questions. And before I know it, I've usually explained a thorny interconnected problem and I can then use that as the basis of an essay. Um, Rubber duck debugging is, came up in Keith Casey's post in the API Futures effort, which I'd recommend. Um, uh, the, the tempting title of how ChatGPT will solve all API problems except yours. <laughs> he, so he had a really thoughtful post that was uh, part of this API Futures effort in January. Um, he also talked about rubber, duck, du rubber ducking and how with LLMs you can go further, how it lets you sort of build these lenses through which you might view your own work. So for instance, as a prospective user who isn't familiar with the problem space, what technology might be confusing to them? Or as a seasoned developer reading this doc, what suggestions would you make to improve it? Or as a copy editor with a fine eye for detail and expert communicator, what needs fixing? Especially spotting mistakes or you know, syntax errors in, uh, in the examples that have been given. Um, so as Keith, Pointing out my, my 
my favorite line from his post is that, um, uh, you know, poorly ap designed APIs will struggle, struggle for adoption on all fronts. Or as he said, the oldest problem in APIs is documentation. Um, so at the, at the beginning of this talk, I talked about the technical contract. And that's the country crunchy hardness that gives open API its structure, but its real power actually comes from the description attributes that attach this sort of squishy natural language to the crunchy analytical bits. This gives guidance that can inform and the dehydrating and rehydrating process, right? Because semantics, they serve purpose. It is, they provide purpose. It's not sufficient to describe the mechanics of an API without also describing its semantics whether or not the consumer is a human or whether it's mediated through an LLM. Semantics join the what does this do and the why does this matter to the how does this work. So the good news is that OpenAPI 3 already offers ways to attach semantics to the description of an API's technical structure. Semantics were baked in from the start because they were meant to describe APIs to humans, but they haven't been an explicit goal until now with Moonwalk OpenAPI v4. Personally, I always thought about open API documents as describing it to the people who will use it. But what's different is that those people don't need to read an open API document or even the rendered HTML from that. There's this new layer emerging where LLMs can bridge the program uh, programmability that APIs invite into the world of natural language. Um, John Miller and I wrote about these principles on the open API blog if you want to read more about this. But I think this is one of the most exciting bits about what's coming with Moonwalk is just the sort of recognition that the semantics are a core power API does. Um, lastly, uh, here come the muggles, right? So what I mean is that people who you don't think of as being API users uh, are suddenly have been enabled by LLMs. So last fall, I was surprised to hear my brother-in-law had started a coding project. I didn't know he knew how to code. He doesn't. It was just that ChatGPT was exactly the boost he needed to pull together information from various places and to bring that into a spreadsheet where he was comfortable and could play with the data. So not only does this bar suddenly get lower, adoption journeys may begin to happen outside your API portal. What happens with discovery? So not, not that long ago, ChatGPT plugins looked like they might be a way that APIs would become available to users in the chat uh, LLM chat context. Should we think about that more like a new kind of user interface, like a graphical user interface, like an app, or is it, uh, or, or is it something else? Are, are these true API users? So I, I can't say for certain, but I want to spend, and I know I'm getting close in time, but I want to spend a couple minutes talking about what might be different if we consider LLM users as a new way uh, to acquire API users, because as I mentioned earlier. APIs have this bi-directional social contract between producers and consumers. It's not enough just to discover the existence of an API. You need to get credentialed, but it's not enough to have credentials. You, there's this ongoing relationship. The boring APIs are the one are, are the ones where like you use the API to export all your data and leave as a customer. The interesting APIs are the ones that have journeys over and over again and get used again and again. So putting on our uh, looking into our crystal ball for a moment. Uh, this is about new new adoption journeys because in some ways the opportunity here is to federate the adoption journey into other places like uh, chat-based LLMs. So it, it's not just that the bar has gotten lower, it's so that we're seeing a whole new class of people who, who could be API users who we couldn't have considered before in the same way. These journeys can start outside of your API portal. Um, it's like federating your API product into other stores. But there's still a relationship to manage and a bunch of interactions that I don't think we've begun to consider enough. Should you be sending these new API users an email, for example? That's like the beginning of the relationship. How are they going to understand the terms of use here? What happens when those change? If a key expires or needs to, uh, or has been compromised, um, how's that going to get cycled? When you're working through this chat-based interface, how will you know as a user that you're running out of quota? Or if it's a monetized API, how do you understand the costs you're incurring or what your bills have been? 
you have problems, things aren't working the way you expect, how do you get support? What if some of these LLMs do, uh, have patterns that get flagged as abuse? How will you know? What do you do about breaking changes to APIs? Are you able to upsell or cross market your other API options that they may not be aware of? Th these are all the kinds of social contract implications that I think we're uh, in danger of overlooking if we think too much about this being solving technical problems and, and just being a thing about usage. No, it's about managing these ongoing relationships with your consumers. Um, what I suspect this means is that while you can onboard API users through a chat interface, their relationship to you will still be managed in something like an API portal. And so thinking about what it might mean to some of these journeys, I think it's going to be a really interesting uh, topic of discussion for the next year. Um, I think I'm a little over time, but thanks. Uh, that, was a, that was a lot. Um, uh, what I'll leave you with is that this is exciting and new, and there's a lot to explore and discover. And the best way I know to do that is to play with it. Um, if you haven't subscribed to at least a GPT-4 level AI, do be curious. And don't forget that a trained circus bear, it, it's still a trained circus bear that can make you porridge. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Marsh. You got me in muggles. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you suddenly had this opportunity to do magic that you didn't before. How cool is that? That's neat. I would love to be a fly on the wall when uh, you had that first conversation with your brother. I, I also have a brother. <laughs> <laughs> and we have a very complimentary skill. So I'm also a muggle in some ways to him. Um, yeah. Not allowed That's to part of the secret of my success, by the way, is that I, I you know, I, I, I learned computer science in university to some degree, but I've never spent, I've never written code as my job directly. I, I, I'm a terrible hack and, and uh, chat GPT just enables me to do more of it, which is great. Ooh, what can possibly go wrong? Um, I really like the, the the questions that you were bringing up um, at the end. Um, it's a bit like the, the the pain point massage. Like, okay, that is where it's going to hurt, and you know it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thank you for yeah, those questions. We're working on the... kind of journeys too. Oh, because... good. It's tricky. Yeah. So, what 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 is your take then? What uh, how, what do you think about some of these journeys? I have a very uh, anticlimactic view on this because I always see the people here. Yes. I see people and I see what can possibly go wrong. So mostly I'm the canary in these conversations. 